Hello, everybody. Welcome to this fantastic panel discussion that we have lined up on health data interoperability. Um, not only is this one of my favorite conversations from a, a point of interest, but it's also an incredibly important conversation for healthcare and an incredibly timely conversation as well with the regulations around it, the ability that we have to process data, the amount of data that we have as well. And so I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to bring together an expert panel to deep, uh, deep dive into, into this topic. Um, we're having some technical difficulties with Tom from Emblem Health, so hopefully he'll be able to join us in a minute or so, and he may pop up on screen. Um, but we have a fantastic panel with us, so I'll ask them all to introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll get going into the Q&A. Um, there is a question function for everyone in the audience, so please feel free to utilise that and utilise you know, the brains that we have in this panel here. Uh, as well. So drop your questions in there. Um, but without further ado, let's get on with the introductions. Um, Angela, perhaps I could ask you to start. Thanks, Jamie. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm Angela Yoakum. I'm with Novant Health, which is a large integrated healthcare system in the southeastern US. Um, we are uh, a system that, that has about 800 locations. Uh, we have 17 major hospitals many clinics and physician centers and outpatient centers. My responsibility is uh, I'm, the, I'm the executive vice president and chief transformation and digital officer. And that spans a number of things. So certainly um, all of the traditional IT sorts of things that we think about in terms of supporting a system of this size, as well as um, all data, all um, clinical informatics, our digital health line of business, which as you can imagine is expanding significantly as we think about the move from um, the, the, the move from uh, just thinking about care being delivered in the traditional venues to care being delivered wherever the patient is. I'm sure we'll talk more about patient centricity today. That's part of my responsibility and also business transformation, which is all new business lines for the company. So it's been a, a, really, uh, a really fun way to, to spend every day for the last four years. Yeah, juggling quite a few very significant balls there, Angela, sounds like one of those jobs, which is probably a, a 26 hour day. Um, so we'll get into some of those elements. Uh, and Kevin, uh, a brief introduction from yourself would be wonderful as well. Hi, I'm Kevin Schulman. I'm a physician internist, also um, uh, hospital medicine. Um, I'm a health services researcher, health economist um, at the medical school and the business school here at Stanford. And I run our new master's of science in clinical informatics management program, uh, one year master's program uh, that uh, it combines both business and technology uh, to kind of focus on the stuff Angela has been talking about in terms of transformation. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, I, I'm Mifan. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, so my name is Mifan Karim. Uh, I'm the vice president of solutions architecture at WSO2. WSO2 is a technology company which focuses on API uh, integration plus identity access management. So I, I really come into this as the technologist, uh, having worked with multiple customers because my job is a customer facing uh, technical job. Uh, so I've worked with customers in the healthcare sector uh, from, from uh, payers to providers to, to pharma, so on and so forth, helping them with their digital transformation journey, uh, as well as companies in the non-healthcare sector. So, so uh, hopefully I can bring those examples into this picture as well. Uh, before joining WSO2, I was working in the humanitarian technology space, which includes healthcare, uh, human rights management, e-government, so on and so forth. Uh, we, we had a, a global project for disaster management where we built an open source system uh, to, to basically help with disaster management. Uh, so that's my background. Uh, happy to be here, Jamie. Thank you, Mifan. And I'm delighted to say that Tom has been able to join us. Tom, you are live. I'm so sorry for dropping you in uh, at the deep end. We're just doing some brief introductions as a panel. So um, I guess it'd be fantastic now that you, you, you've been able to make it. And thank you for um, your, your flexibility in joining us for, for, uh, uh, for that. And so uh, an introduction would be superb. Sure. Uh, and thanks for having us and thanks for recognizing Emblem Health on the call. So uh, again, my name is Tom McMillan. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Emblem Health. 
Uh, Emblem Health is a uh, leading healthcare uh, insurance provider uh, and also the uh, parent owner of Advantage Care Physicians of New York, which is a leading uh, population health uh, uh, provider uh, also in the New York City area. Um, so we treat over 3 million uh, and insure over 3 million New Yorkers in the uh, New York City metro area in Connecticut. Um, by background, I've uh, been with Emblem for almost nine years and prior to that worked in um, consulting as well as in the provider and payer spaces across industries. So just really happy to be here and uh, share perspectives that I can offer. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, Angela, I'll, I'll address the first question to yourself, um, but, but folks, feel free to feel free to chip in. Uh, so the title of this session is A New Era of, of Collaboration. Yeah, interoperability as a concept, I suppose, has been around for some time, but there is this sentiment that it is a new era. So uh, it's a, a two part question, I suppose. Do you feel like it is a new era for interoperability? And what's been holding us back so far in making interoperability a reality in healthcare? So thank you, that's an excellent question. First, um, yes, I believe it is a new era. I think it's a new era for a number of reasons, uh, not just the um, shifting you know, regulatory um, appetites, but also because of the um, diversification we see in terms of the leaders related to solutioning um, uh, solutioning the, the platforms and the and the tool sets that are used by systems like ours, by entities like those represented here, um, as far as changing, you know, share, sharing data and, and all of that. So I think that's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a changing appetite and that's why it's new. Now, the technology to allow for interoperability has been around forever, right? The technologies that are being used, understanding of course that formats and, you know, standards are continuing to evolve, but my goodness, um, there is no technical reason why we couldn't have been interoperable long before now. Um, we have uh, an environment where historically, I think, now I'm new to healthcare in the sense I've been around about four years, um, but my, my sense is that we've had a rather um, unnatural reliance on very large EHR vendors to sort of host all of our data, sort of in the way that large corporates used to have on ERP systems, you know, 20 years ago when you know, all of your business data was in SAP and you had no chance of getting your hands on it, right? So, you know, now, of course, with, with uh, the large EHR vendors opening, opening up a little bit and allowing us to get our hands on our own clinical data and the data that, be that ultimately belongs and reflects um, uh, our patients' health journeys, um, we can get our hands, liberate that data from the EHR, put it in something that's more open and accessible, um, obviously highly secured, leverage standard formats, um, API-based access, um, leverage the emerging and, and continuing, uh, continuing to evolve standards for that data exchange and, and make sure that the data is where it needs to be so that our clinicians and uh, people engaging with the, the patient have the best possible information and insights they, they, they possibly can have as we, as we administer care. You know, and I think there's probably a lot. Uh, so, so I'll I'll ask uh, Mifon. Are you? Uh, do you agree with what I said about the technology being around, or or was that a bunch of hooey? No, I I think you are absolutely right, Angela. And, and the technology has been around for a long time, uh, for some reason or the other. And and you pointed uh, those reasons out really well. Uh, healthcare has been holding back. Uh, if you look at some of the other industries, like if you look at banking, for example, uh, especially in in Europe, right? So so. There was a government regulation for open banking. All the banks were supposed to expose uh, customer data or consumer data to third-party applications. And there was this whole boom of banking financial applications that, that came up in Germany, UK, and, and now, of course, in Australia, Asia Pacific, Latin America. Uh, so so that, that regulatory drive has been there for some time. Uh, and even in the other industries like retail and, and uh, transportation and so many other industries, at least I've seen API-driven integration uh, play a huge role. Uh, everyone's looking at digital transformation. Everyone's looking at exposing APIs and enabling uh, consumers, enabling applications. But in healthcare, of course, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you're on the fence, right? You have the security and privacy side of things. Uh, you, you then have the, the large EHR players, like you said. So it has been slow, uh, but, but I absolutely agree. The technology has been around. Uh, but but things seem to be looking bright. Uh, just to answer Jamie's question as well, this seems to be the new 
era in interoperability and, and things seem to be opening up, uh, especially here in the US. Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll come behind Angela's comments. I mean, I think one of the other things that's held healthcare um, to a slower pace than things like banking is, is the data itself. So clinicians have been hesitant for a very long time to say, here, I'll give my chart on a patient to somebody else and let them interpret what I meant. And so things like lab values have been easy to integrate for years, but the broader sense of your true medical record being available across clinical areas, one doctor to the next, has been a hesitancy, I think, across the industry. You know, banking, $1.20 is $1.20 no matter who you are. Um, I think clinical data has always had this, this onus of, of how you interpret it. And so I, I would say, I think Angela's right in terms of we've seen some consolidation of the EMR space, but I think actually in some odd way that's helped the interoperability because when you've got 10 providers all working on the same EMR, the ability to reflect that data in a less subjective way from one version of that EMR to the next, you know, my Microsoft Windows is the same as somebody else's Microsoft Windows. I can share an Excel sheet and it's always gonna resolve in the same way. And so I think consistency of the, of the medical record technology and its broader adoption has actually allowed people to be a little bit less hesitant at sharing sensitive clinical data. It can be a secure transaction. It always should be a secure transaction. You know, we, we put a lot of onus on making sure we, we are always secure. But I think the just the maturity overall of the use of EMR and some of that consolidation has allowed for a little bit less hesitancy in um, how will my data be used? And then I think coming behind that, we've seen a lot more regulatory guidance. Uh, you know, interoperability is something now that's come into the payer landscape that um, is empowering, I think, the, the consumer, whether they live as a patient or as a, as a member of an insurance plan, uh, to dictate, hey, share my data with this person. I'm okay with how they're going to receive it and use it. Um, and so that allows the standards to do their job at the direction of, of kind of the consumer. So just, just a couple of kind of thoughts to come behind. There, there are a number of, sorry, Kevin, I'll allow you to. Yeah, no, this is great. Uh, great start to the conversation. So, um, you know, to, it's kind of, I'm reflecting on Tom's perspective here about uh, doctors worried about sharing data. You know, it's, it's actually patients have had a right, legal right to access to the data since 1996 in the HIPAA law. And, and basically it was not in anyone's business interest to share data. Uh, and so 21st Century Cures actually had a mandate that both the software vendors and the providers had to share data that people have had a right to for 25 years. Um, so um, we do have that legal framework now. The regs are finally out. It took five years to get regs about how people can get access to data they have had a right to. Um, and there's an interesting contrast to legal services where you know, if you go see a lawyer, even if you don't pay them, you own the record. But in healthcare, you, you know, the only reason why providers ever owned records was in the old days when you bought a physician practice, the way they valued the practice was the number of charts. And so if you said, I have 2000 people in my practice, they would audit the number of charts to see if there are 2000 charts. And that, that was the only kind of ownership that, that, you know, that medical community had over the record. Otherwise it was the patient's information. Um, so I want to really kind of say what's, what's shifting or what the opportunity is now, and it's not totally there, um, is if the data are liberated, this has been the argument all along, then the business model will shift. Um, you know, and we've seen some new entries into the market and, you know, forward and one medical uh, as competitors to integrated systems, um, you know, potentially more exp less expensive alternatives. We things, see things like devoted in the Medicare Advantage space. Um, you know, if we if you actually had an advocate, you know, a, either a primary care physician, a primary care service uh, that was powered by your clinical data um, and, and a decent technology stack, you know, you might be able to get much better performance um, for your own personal health care than you would ever get from one Epic shop being able to communicate with another Epic shop. That moving data between Epic is not interoperability. Moving data to where users can access it for services is actually what's interesting. 
I think it's a it's a fascinating conversation, and um, you know, we as an industry and as organisations in healthcare and otherwise have optimised over the years around retaining data within our moats, and now there's a dynamic of interoperability at play. And it seems to be the consensus in, in, in this panel, if I'm understanding correctly, is it hasn't been uh, a technology challenge so much to become interoperable, but the structures and incentives around um, sharing data haven't necessarily been there. And so as we approach this balancing act, I suppose, of collaboration versus competition, um, I guess the question is, is whom is responsible for what? And one of the, the questions that, that's coming from an anonymous attendee, which I'll pose, perhaps your Kevin, yourself, Kevin, first, is is passing the buck blame to EHR vendors. Hospitals, health systems share just as much, if not, if not more blame, and large transformation firms. So is there more that we can all be doing, whether we're hospitals, health systems, payers, or otherwise, to liberate data? Yeah, I mean, if you go back, um, you know, if you go back to high tech, um, the, the business model for the software vendors was to sell through health systems. Health systems basically were able, we're, we're already in the business of buying up practices um, and integrating. Um, and so the business model of the EMR vendors kind of coincided with the business model or was shaped by the business model of systems that, you know, as, Novant, as Angela said, you know, Novant's put together this large, very large network. Um, EMR has helped with that because the primary care docs couldn't get access to the EMR unless they got acquired uh, or licensed through the system. So uh, it was definitely anti-competitive. Um, you know, the um, on the software side and the health system side, um, I, I was uh, moved from North Carolina a couple of years ago. Um, the bonds in the only competitive market in the state. Uh, the rest of the markets in North Carolina are totally non-competitive. And actually, one of them just got sued for antitrust um, in, in Western North Carolina. So, um, you know, we've had, we've used this move to technology where we've made the practice much more complex. It's been to great advantage of the provider systems all across the country. Um, and that's driven up the cost to Tom and, and Emblem. Um, I don't know what it is in New York City on average you know, commercial payers are paying 250% of Medicare for inpatient and outpatient services, according to RAND. Uh, and I imagine it might be even higher in New York. And that's all because of the leverage that's been built uh, around hospitals over the last 20 years. So I think that there are a couple of things, you know, that question, uh, Jamie, that you read, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think I heard anybody here, at least, including myself, um, blame the EMR vendors. Um, I think the, I think the, um, the, the architecture and the, the, you know, the overall structure of the way those, those vendor products evolved is very much in line with other very, very large um, functional um, software platforms that, that were specific to, you know, a, a very specific business purpose. And so, you know, I, I think that's a very natural uh, they've they've experienced a very natural life cycle of evolution of a very very complex space. So I've, I'm a big admirer of those of those firms, um, and I, I also admire the recent um, pivot to a more open structure that I think is going to help us achieve many of the things that have been referenced by the other panelists here. So when we think about getting our hands on data that is um, that will help us do things like predict major health events before they happen, that will help us know how best to engage our patients in their own health and wellness journey, that will allow us to provide the patients with a patient in the center of a view that they own and that they can apply to their entire health and wellness journey, regardless of whether our entity plays a part in that journey or how big that part might be. So, I mean, we're all probably headed towards the same eventual uh, circumstance. Uh, the question is, you know, as our business models continue to evolve, you know, how, how, you know, how we, how we optimize inside of our own systems. But I think over, overarchingly, um, some of the, some of the ways in which we made money in the past will no longer be constraints for us when we think about what we can do for the patients. I 
we've got some more questions that, that have come in for the audience uh, and there's there's some fantastic questions so keep them coming but there's one in particular um in reference to some points that you made tom from from chris Klansman. um so i'll address it yourself but i'd love perspectives from the panel on this as well um so following from your comments on anchors weighing down in top mobility what's behind the hesitancy for sharing uh, the clinician's perspective uncertainty perceived liability risk um and i suppose as a, a b-side to that question how can we mitigate hesit hesitancy around sharing from from the clinician perspective well i, I think it was i think it was born out of a, a very <clears throat> kind of good intent that we didn't ever want to misconstrue clinical information it's just too important patient safety for all of us in the provider business is always at the top of the list right so from the actual clinicians to you know, provider administrators that I think that and maybe I use the word hesitancy. I think it was around making sure that when you are interoperating data and a good portion of it is clinical, it's a very human thing. And, and so patient safety hits the top of the mark. And so um, I think it was a, a little bit born out of making sure that we weren't chucking data over the fence to another provider, unsure of how it was going to land and whether or not it was going to land in a way that maintain, you know, patient uh, patient first and patient centric kind of usage. So um, again, I, I think we've seen the technology, the actual underlying you know, pipes, if you will, the plumbing has been around for a very long time to be able to do this. I think how the data gets handled and how it gets interpreted upon sending and receipt um, is maturing a little bit. And I think, you know, to, to Kevin's point, you know, sending it from one branded EMR like Epic to another instance of a branded EMR, you're not, you're not transforming or making that data different from its starting point to its landing point. But from a clinical perspective, from the patient's perspective, they're able to walk into two physical different locations that have no business relationship and have a continuity of their care. And so however we want to term that, whether it's sharing of data, whether it's interoperability of data, I think it's accomplishing the perspective that um, you know, as a patient-centered or as a population-centered kind of point of view, you know, we as an industry will need to continue to move in that direction because, um, you know, take COVID over the last 18 or 20 months, we've seen people shift to maybe using a different provider than they used to use because a new provider offers a virtual health model. Well, how do I bring my clinical data with me, right? Um, we, we're seeing regulations that are going to ultimately take a little bit more of a foothold. So I, I think, I think again, it's less maybe maybe hesitancy is the wrong word to use, but just a, a good kind of um, do no harm instinct, right? That we didn't want to really dive deeply into this until we knew how to do it. And, and I think you know, I, I will say, you know, early days there was a lot of investment in um, Rios or in regional health networks or these kind of I'll call them clearinghouse exchanges, which were their promise was, hey, we, we won't fumble the ball, right? We'll take data from one entity and we know how to handle that clinical data and that admissions data. And we'll, we'll share it to other participating providers in that best interest of the patient to be able to get them uh, cared for in any setting. But those didn't have really, frankly, an economic foot to stand on. You know, the providers had to pay to run that clearinghouse, as, as Kevin said, to, to quite frankly, undermine their their economic goals in the time and then the 90s and early 2000s, which was what's my patient. So if I have to pay a middleman to be able to let my patient go somewhere else, that's a double negative for them, right? And so I think those have peaked and we're seeing now less of the, the, the kind of centralized clearinghouse model of interoperability and more of, hey, let's actually use this technology, the piping, um, to allow me to talk directly to Perhaps somebody that is in a, in a business relationship, a clinically integrated network where a provider works with other providers to, to give the best overall care. And, and this gets into population health and value-based care. And I, I will say, I think the interoperability is a big enabler to true value-based care, right? Because there was a um, financial world out there that said, hey, if I'm going to take the total onus for keeping a person healthy, which is the goal, right? That's value-based care and population health is keep them healthy, not, not manage their sickness. Um, I got to know about all the you know, clinical interactions that are going on in their life. Could be with me as a provider, could be someplace else. Um, and so the interoperability is, is raising the, or enabling the ability for providers to manage whole health by seeing a true 
end-to-end -end picture of a person um, clinically. Uh, and, and then you start even talking about you know, social determinants and other things that can be shared through some level of interoperability um, that really start to embellish that picture and make it more than just, hey, how many times did I come to the doctor when I'm sick? But what are the factors that we can start to share amongst a group of people trying to, to manage wellness for, for risk populations? And so um, I think, you know, Angela said it, you know, it, it will continue to change the business model. It's going to open up different business models, but it, it's certainly going to be a change factor. There were many aspects uh, to that answer. So a few things I'm keen to, to dig into, but but Mifan, I'll, I'll turn to you. One of the points that, that, that Tom raised there, I think the phrase was chucking data over the fence. You know, we are ultimately in an interoperable system, sharing data with counterparts and third parties. So it's not just a case of being responsible for the data that we have or we steward. There's also responsibility for making sure that those counterparts are equally responsible and their processes are as well. So how do you approach things like consent and transparency with a system where you, the, the lowest common denominator isn't just your organization, but it's you know the, the, the chain with which you operate it? Yeah, so, so interoperability is usually a supply chain problem as well, right? You, you have multiple source systems, you have multiple destination systems. Uh, source systems push information in different formats, destination requires it in different formats. Uh, I did see a question on uh, the impact of FIRE, uh, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, and HL7V2. Uh, so, so common uh, formats, uh, uh, canonical models, within that interoperability system, right? Uh, but, but you're right. So what we've seen and what I've seen in many systems, healthcare and otherwise, is that you have these multiple source systems. They can be EHR systems. They can be your Fitbit data, your personal data. Uh, and as a provider or as a payer, you need the ability of connecting to those multiple systems and pulling them and then exposing those systems to like applications who need it in certain formats. Uh, or, or some payer who needs it in a different format, right? So, so basically, interoperability is really, at some point, moving the problem to a higher layer, right? Like, for example, we are talking about uh, EPIC and the larger EHRs, EMRs uh, being more interoperable. Uh, but then at the same time, there are providers uh, who, who work with multiple EHR systems, right? So, it's, so it's, yes, it is one problem where the EHR itself has to expose standard compliant data, but then the provider also needs to have a layer which can connect to multiple systems. Uh, there, there was an example, I think, uh, in earlier this year in the Forbes magazine, where uh, one of the hospital chains had to connect to three different EMR, EHR systems and pull information out. Uh, they weren't able to do that successfully. So they, they decided to just switch to a very large EHR vendor, which was like a half a billion dollar project, right? Which is a, like a three to four year project. So, so even the smaller year charts are struggling to really keep up to, to expose data in an interoperable manner. It's not just a, a challenge with the larger year chart vendors. So, so for me, from what I've seen, uh, interoperability can be handled at different levels. It can be handled at a higher level, not just at the year chart level. You can have something at a higher level, like an API system, uh, an integration system that can connect to all these backend pieces. Uh, and, and then you handle it that way. The second part of the question, Jamie, is, is consent, right? So when you start pulling information about a patient, like if a provider is pulling my information, where do I as a patient come into the picture? Uh, where do I get to say that, yes, you're pulling my data. Uh, I'm okay with providing consent to provider A to give this data to provider B or to application C, right? So that's where self uh, self-service uh, consent management comes into play. Uh, so, so we have seen like if you walk into a provider, you have to fill a consent management form, which is usually a paper form or some digital format. But we are now talking about interoperability consent management, right? So if an application like Apple Healthcare is going to call an API, which fetches my information, I need to be able to provide consent for that piece of data or I need to be able to delegate consent, let's say my son's data, right? So that's a delegated consent management problem. So uh, what we're seeing in the interoperability space is that this whole consent management piece is quite important, right? And that's gonna play a huge role uh, in, in the future as well. 
We've had a really interesting question come in from Sujith, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You know, we often, you know, we we advocate for interoperability and we we look at the, the challenges, but it's important also to be cognizant of the risks as we as we're building that infrastructure. And so Sujith has asked, uh, we all know about the pros, but what are some of the cons? Uh, and the implications. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one open to the panel. So what are some of the cons and the risks of interoperability? Yeah, maybe um, I, I want to kind of go back and um, and say, you know, think about what the use case is. All right. So, um, you know, I moved from North Carolina to California. All right. If I show up in the emergency room, where's my record? Like, how are they going to, how are people going to take care of me? Um, or I, if I have chronic diabetes, like imagine if I actually, I had an app that could help me, but, you know, I would need access to my lab data, you know, whether there's a problem like creatinine or whether my hemoglobin A1C is under control. Um, and so, you know, it's easy, you know, I think we have to really have in the back of our mind, what's the positive use case for your so there is always a risk benefit trade-off. Now there's huge risk to having your data scattered all over the place. There's huge risk to having your data at Stanford or you know, uh, at Emblem or um, at Novant. Um, there's risk there too. I mean, the CIO's job, uh, I don't know about Angela, but most CIOs at health systems, their job is to make sure there's no data breach. If there is, they're fired, um, but they're not in charge of making sure there's any really good use of the data. They won't get fired because I couldn't get access to the data for an API. They will get fired for a breach. Um, you know, I'm being a little tongue in cheek, but uh, you know, I think we it, it's really what we haven't done is really articulate what are the positive use cases. And so then, when we understand the positive use cases, we could do risk benefit. It's very easy to say there's a risk to this. There's some existential risk to this. Um, you know, we went to telemedicine last year, and I went on the ONC's website. Uh, I'm sorry, the HHS website. There were no data breaches reported to HHS related to telemedicine, but we had argued for 20 years that there was a risk to doing video, you know, video visits. Um, you know, so we, you know, I think what we're not doing is doing a good job of articulating what do we want to liberate the data to? What are the economic benefits and the clinical benefits to us as consumers if we could actually use our data? Um, and uh, I had a big argument with this with a, a group of Israeli students who have these HMOs where all their data is contained in HMO. And I said, well, that's great, but it's not very useful. It's not accessible to you or to digital services. Just because data stored in an environment in a vault um, is great. It's really secure, but it's not very useful. Um, so I think the, the issue is not the risk, but really the risk benefit. I think they're interesting parallels with the, the telehealth conversation, you know, that boomed out of necessity. Um, and as an industry, I think it's incumbent on us to kind of leverage that period of innovation or, you know, the, the, the speed and urgency that the crisis has provided to other aspects of healthcare and interoperability um, being, being one of them. Um, so I'd, but I'd love to get perspectives from the panel of, what that vision could be to your point, Kevin, around articulating, you know, in five years time, how healthcare might look if interoperability uh, allows for, you know, the potential growth or potential change in how we could, how we could deliver care. Um, Angela, I'd love to start with you on that, if that's okay. And that five-year time view is extraordinarily important because as society continues to evolve and we have a better understanding of all of the elements that are influencing the health of our communities, uh, the more important our job is uh, in terms of ex ex expanding access to care for our own use, as well as for the use of the patients as they manage their own wellness. You know, a couple of things um, in response to, to what I thought Kevin made some very excellent points um, about the cost associated, the, the risk associated with not allowing for interoperability. Um, we would fire our CIO if, if, if the CIO was blocking <laughs> <laughs> blocking us from being able to provide um, life-saving care 
um, because they wanted to hoard the data. I mean, he, he, he doesn't, that's, we hired him uh, because we know that he doesn't. Um, but that is, that is something that, that, that healthcare systems should fire their CIOs if they're artificially constraining the ability to do anything meaningful for the patients with, with the data that exists. And when we think about where the data is being liberated to, um, in our case, we, uh, we, work with a ver- we, we work with a very large ecosystem of partners. And these partners join us in a variety of different contexts to provide remarkable care to our patients and our communities. And many of the care delivery mechanisms are either digital in nature or are enhanced through digital means. Um, providing our patients with a very seamless, cohesive engagement. So for example, if one of our patients moves to California and wants to, <laughs> wants to have some, <laughs> wants, to, wants to be able to share, uh, share their data, it's a, it's, a, it's a button click on the app or maybe a couple clicks. Um, there may be a text entry field, but you know, it's very simple. And the, the other thing that that patient can, can do and the, if, they're, if they're an Avon Health patient, is they can rely on us to, to use natural language processing. I saw some semantic questions and some machine language questions um, in, the, in the chat. Um, we, we use natural language processing to, 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 to parse through notes. You know, how reasonable is it to expect that your primary care physician has read through 10 years worth of your own notes before your next appointment? You know, it probably differs from physician to physician and, and routines to routines, but um, if we can help with that, if we can automate some of that using the technology that's available to us today, that, so, so when we talk about liberating our data, we liberated it to a data lake that's cloud-based, highly secured. We have a robust API layer that sits in front of it. Yes, it supports Fire. Yes, it supports HL7. But yes, it, it also supports a number of other mechanisms by which we can, by which we can exchange data. If we are reliant and waiting on a standard by which we will exchange data, a single standard, then we will be forever constrained by the elements that are defined as part of that standard. There will be additional data element types that continue to expand. There will be obviously a bazillion images. We already know that. There will be a video. There will be um, there will be um, sound recordings of, of lung function. There will be, and, and there are today those things in our records. So as we think about sharing data and making sure that a patient's data is not only accessible to us for advanced analysis, but also accessible to other members of their care team that may expand beyond our four walls, we have to be very crisp about how we're able to share and how easy, easily we're able to share um, that data uh, at the patient's request um, or within our own ecosystem, which expands beyond our four walls as well. And so, yeah, and I think that, Jamie, I think that comes back around to the consent aspect, right? So as Angela says, we can build a thousand technical bridges to someplace else to do the right thing, right? And, and, and you know, there's this notion, I think it's like every six months now, the amount of data stored doubles globally, right? So like, we're creating these much more than just, you know, textual type of, of, of data sets out there. But that consent layer has to get sorted out at a patient and at a, I'll call it, you know, an entity, right? Whether it's a provider, provider's partner provider, because there's been a lot in, and so in our market, there was a lot of consent issues beyond just patient consent and HIPAA driven consent to even allow, you know, entity A and B to talk to each other. Right, um, and, and so that kind of limited the ability for us to leverage for the value of both the entities and the patients or providers, the interoperability. So I think if I wanted to, I'll say, it's not a prediction, it's not what I think, but I, I, I would love to see us sort the consent issue in some sort of a kind of broadcast and receiver type of manner so that you know, we can unlock the potential for that interoperability. Because as long as, you know, whether it's the CIO hoarding it or whether it's the patient not acknowledging or understanding that they need to consent to kind of future sharing for their clinical benefit, those all become blockers that start to limit the value proposition of some level of interoperability, right? Um, And and I think the consent is going to have to become increasingly broad because as Angela said that there's different use cases than it used to be right it used to be okay well I consent to give my chart to somebody else well what does that mean right you know if somebody's got a data set that's derived from a clinical note you know it's it's, who do we share that with when do we share it what's the appropriate state so um, I think digitizing that consent layer and making sure that it's available as part of the interoperability standard is going to be a big enabler. And that just to come back to your question around consents. 
we've all uh consent such a tricky thing because we've all probably signed things without reading the, the the fine point and so achieving that consent there's the, the communication of what that consent is for and then there's the i suppose the value exchange so to kind of come around to to the question you know kevin around articulating what that value is i'd love to get your kind of you know five-year vision for the possibility uh of interoperability and so if you go back to you know I guess one easy use case, um, we talk about the sources and uses of funding in healthcare. Um, and the use of health funding in healthcare is a very small proportion of the population that's got catastrophic illness. And, you know, 20% of healthcare spending is on less than 1% of the population. Um, all of these buildings in healthcare are designed to take care of that, that 1% of the population. Um, in October, I'm going to do open enrollment and I'm going to sign up for health insurance. It's going to cost me and my employer, you know, somewhere for my family around $20,000, if not more. And I'm going to get nothing for it. Absolutely nothing. Um, actually, I, I haven't had a primary care physician visit in three years. Um, I don't, you know, I, I have to do my own uh, compliance with cancer screening prevention. Um, if I go to the doctor, unfortunately, I'm in a high deductible health plan. It costs me a fortune. Um, and I, why would I pay? I get, you know, it's the worst spend I have all year is this $20,000. Now, imagine I actually had an app and here's my digital health journey. I get some messaging. I get some video chat with providers um, that doesn't cost me a fortune. I get help with whatever, you know, my, my health goals are. Um, you know, access to some resources, um, you know, to, you know, to get me on my healthcare journey uh, for $20,000. It's not $20,000 worth of value, but at least it's something. But to feed that, I would have to actually get access to my health data. So, you know, imagine there's like a core underlying set of health data that I get access to, and then out, I'm in Silicon Valley. So there's no shortage of people here that could build tools on top of that data that would make it really useful for me as a consumer. I don't have to get involved with it. I, I probably do for the consent, I could do one click. Um, you know, if, if you do Apple, you, you know, we have different levels of security for some of these things, uh, but there's plenty of other ways. But you know, I could easily imagine at a minimum, I would have something for the 70% of the population that actually doesn't use healthcare services, that give them some access to services. Um, but I think we could also take the, the sick people, the, di the disease management people. Uh, and, you know, imagine diabetes is a whole set of tools. You know, we just saw this company called Avongo, who where people actually care and follow up, you know, as a primary care physician, you know, if you didn't come in my office, you were, you know, that was it. You know, imagine I can go after you. I can help you with your meds. Uh, these are all services that you have everywhere else in, in your life that we don't have in healthcare. It makes, it makes no sense. So moving healthcare out of physical environments and physical interactions into more ubiquitous um, ways of hopefully keeping you out of really expensive parts of healthcare, which is, you know, getting your cancer diagnosed too late, showing up in the emergency room, um, you know, not being able to take your medicines because you don't understand them. Um, those, those are the things that really cost us a lot of money. And Mifan, I, I saw you kind of nodding along there. So does your kind of vision, you know, remain similar to, to Kevin's? And, and I suppose, you know, what's your kind of advice for, you know, if you're working with an organizational partner, you know, building this vision, you know, practically, what's the kind of the, the key pieces there? Yeah, I, I was I was nodding along. Uh, I, I completely agree with Kevin and and what Tom was saying as as well. Uh, so basically, HHS uh, as part of their vision also expects that there'll be an explosion of uh, apps, mobile apps, and desktop apps and web apps uh, around healthcare. And and these don't necessarily mean like apps owned by the EHRs and providers, but but totally third party apps like Apple Healthcare and and, and Google Healthcare, Google Health, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so, so that's that's really critical. And as Kevin mentioned and Tom mentioned, consent management is a big part of it. Uh, One-click consent management. 
but not just the manage, uh, not just providing consent, but being able to revoke consent as well. Right? So whenever you don't like something, you go back and say, I revoke consent to this part, uh, or being able to drill down and say, like, for example, if you take a patient API or patient fire resource, resource within that you have your first name, your date of birth, your SSN and your address, for example. So, so may, maybe going in and saying, I don't want to share my uh, PII or PHI information. I want to share the rest of the information. So being able to manage consent is a critical part of this. Uh, so that whole explosion of apps, ubiquitous apps is, is what I see as the future. Uh, and then as part of that, you, you have the whole, the whole IoT, the sensor space, right? You have your Fitbits, you have your diabetes sensors, which already communicate with your phone and having the ability of passing that information to your primary care physician and, and enabling like predictive healthcare, right? they can reach out to you if something really goes wrong. Right? Uh, that's, that's a critical part of this as well. Uh, in terms of how uh, you'd work with an organization, so, so the key part as, as Kevin and, and Angela mentioned is, is to look at the, the use cases, right? What are you trying to achieve now? What are, what's your two-year plan? What's your five-year plan? Technology will continue to change over five years, right? And, but, but you need to have your vision uh, lay out the APIs, lay out the core building blocks, uh, and, and then start working with uh, external organizations. Uh, the, the organizations that have open standards, that work with multiple stakeholders, be it competition or, or partners, uh, so, uh, um, fare better than, than someone who's trying to tackle everything themselves, right? So uh, that, that's something uh, we've seen in the industry. Fantastic. So I, I usually like to kind of wrap up with, with key takeaways, but we, we're just over time. But I think the, the, the visions that you've all shared um, offer a kind of a fantastic summary for, for what this could be. There's so many questions that have come in from the audience and regrettably we haven't been able to get around to them. But um, you know, hopefully you know, we, can, we can bring everyone here back for a take two uh, at some point because there's so much more um, that we could dissect here. Um, but Angela, Thomas, Kevin, Mifan, thank you so much for your time and your expertise today. It's been a pleasure to discuss uh, this topic with you. Thank you to WSO2 for their partnership uh, on this and putting this together with us. And, and thanks again for everyone for, for listening in and for being so engaged. Um, but for now, that will be over and out. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>